Welcome everyone. It's really nice to see you again after our little hiatus. Um, if you would like to, we're gonna get started in just a, a minute, um, but if you'd like to uh, put in the chat where you're calling in from today and maybe a little bit about how your day was, um, if you feel inclined. Um, but we're super excited to be here with Claire and Hope and all of you. Hi everybody, I'm excited to be here. We'll give it a couple of minutes. We have Hope Edelman with us today. Great. Lopez Island, I have been to Lopez Island. I love that place. I spent a lot of time on orcas. Oh wow, Elizabeth's calling in from Costa Rica too. Yeah. Nice. I love seeing where people are coming from. Massachusetts, my old stomping ground. Awesome. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to get started. Oh, we have somebody from Canada. Okay. This is one's from all over the place. Okay. Um, great. And I forgot to mention, um, Claire, as I'm doing this, if you can, um, just doing the intro, if you can admit people from the waiting room, they just change their functionality so that I can't just disable it. But if you can't, don't worry, I'll do it. As no, I keep seeing it pop up. I'm happy to do it. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay, well, welcome to Holding Space uh, with Claire Bidwell-Smith and Hope Edelman. Uh, my name is Dara Kosberg and I am the program director at Reimagine. Um, and we're a nonprofit organization that sparks community experiences like this one, um, empowering individuals, families, and communities to face the hardest parts of their existence, including illness and death, um, while inspiring people to celebrate life and one another. And before we get started, um, I just wanted to acclimate you to Zoom. Um, as some of you may remember, these are my cats, Sammy and Biscuit. And um, just to say, oops, that um, you should keep your mic off. Um, and uh, we will be doing the Q&A um, about 30 minutes in, but you can ask your questions on the chat. Um, you can uh, turn your camera on or off, but we recommend keeping it on just to make us feel more connected. Um, and lastly, if the chat is distracting you, um, you can feel free to, um, in the right-hand corner, just close it out. And um, I also just wanted to thank our festival sponsors um, who are shown here, who support Reimagine and make this work possible, along with all of um, the donations that we receive um, from, from attendees. So thank you for, for donating and supporting this work. And um, I uh, am just gonna introduce Claire, uh, who is a internationally renowned author, speaker, and grief expert. Um, she's the author of three books of nonfiction, The Rules of Inheritance, after this, when life is over, where do we go? And anxiety, the missing stage of grief. Um, and uh, last festival, she hosted um, this weekly meeting that normally is scheduled um, during the day at 11. So we'll be going back to that time after this session. Um, or sorry, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific. And um, we will be doing programming throughout the Creating Space Festival that ends on December 9th. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Claire, but I just wanted to just highlight um, uh, Hope Edelman's new book, The After Grief, uh, which you will be discussing today. Thank you so much, Dara. Hi, everybody. Um, I am so excited to be back for this second season series of Holding Space, um, and I'm so excited to have Hope Edelman as our first guest. I started this series back in the spring in um, late March, early April, just as a place for all of us to come and talk about all the huge stuff that we were feeling. Um, Hope and I have been in the grief world for a long time, and I think there were just so many big questions and thoughts and feelings coming up about grief, about end of life, about anxiety, and, and I wanted to bring all the amazing people I know in the end of life space together and hold space for you guys to explore it a little more. Um, so I'm really happy to be back for season two, I guess we're going to call it. <laughs> and, and Hope is the most amazing person to kick it off with. And her new book, I'm going to read her bio, but we will get more into 
who she is in a deeper level. Um, but Hope Edelman is the author of eight nonfiction books, including the bestsellers Motherless Daughters and Motherless Mothers, and the memoir The Possibility of Everything. Her work has received a New York Times Notable Book of the Year designation and a Pushcart Prize for creative nonfiction. The recipient of the 2020 Community Educator Award from the Association for Deaf Education and Counseling. She's also certified as a Martha Beck certified life coach and facilitates motherless daughter retreats and workshops all over the world. Welcome. Paul. Thank you, Claire. It's good to see all of you here. Thank you all for taking time out of your day. And I see in the chat box and on the screen, a number of women who come to our retreats, Claire, and also people that um, I know or have intersected with us in the Philippines and in Ireland and in Canada. It's really wonderful to see such an international representation here. So Hope and I have been working together for a long time and we've run a lot of uh, retreats together for motherless daughters and I tell the same story at every retreat and every time we do an event together and I have to tell it because it, it is honestly, Hope, one of the most meaningful moments of my life. Um, I was 18 years old and, or sorry, I was 20 years old and living in New York City and my mother had died two years prior when I was 18. And I was living in Manhattan and I was really, really struggling with the loss of my mom and um, I just didn't know where to turn. All the messages I received about this death and loss were that I should be okay about it. I was young, I should be moving on, I was in college, and I was not okay. And I walked into a bookshop in Astor Place one afternoon, and there was a whole display, like a giant shelf of motherless daughters. And I stopped in my tracks, you guys. It was the first time I felt like wow, it's, it's okay. This is a real thing. Like it's, it's okay that I'm not okay. It's okay that I'm still missing my mom. And it was such a validating experience for me in my journey of grief. And um, it was the first moment I really allowed, like gave myself permission to let my grief extend, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. And two years is nothing. I now know I'm, I'm 22 years out from this loss and still missing my mom and still grateful for your book, Hope. But uh, it was a pleasure to really um, meet Hope and become colleagues and co-facilitators and partners together. Um, and I would love for you to tell us um, a little bit about you and your background and lead us into this new book and how you got here. Sure, sure. Well, my favorite part of your story is always that I was living only two or three blocks away at the time. And we didn't know it. We were so close. We must have intersected in the bookstore or, you know, on St. Mark's Place or 8th Street or somewhere at the time, but um, we were neighbors. <clears throat> so thank you. Yes, um, Claire and I have been working together pretty consistently for about four years, um, four and a half years, and we've known each other for much longer than that. And it's one of the great joys of my professional life is to be doing this work with Claire. Um, I was 17 years old when my mom died of cancer, and um, years later, when I was an adult at 40, which is already 16 years ago, I lost my dad to cancer as well. But when I lost my mom in 1981, there was nothing. Like Claire said, there was nothing. And I went looking for a book, and I couldn't find one, and I kept going back to the library and the bookstores and through college and into graduate school. And finally, I just thought, well, heck, you know, here I am in a graduate writing program. I might as well look into writing this book myself. And that's how Motherless Daughters was born. It came out in 1994, and it's been updated twice. So I've had the chance to revisit it at different points in my life. So it came out when I, in 1994, when I was 29 years old and I was single and I was living in New York and I didn't know if I was ever going to experience the life transitions that um, my mother had been through, like marriage and, and parenthood or, or early disease because she was diagnosed at the age of uh, 39 and she did 40, 40 and she died or 40, 41 and she died at 42. And um, then I revisited the book in 2006 to do a, a new edition, a second edition. And by that time I was married, I had two little girls. I was right on the cusp of turning 42 myself. And my mother's death, early death looked very different to me from that perspective. And then for the 20th anniversary of the book, I was about 50 and I revisited it again. And then it really looked different because I'd lived so far beyond how old my mom was. But the after grief is something different. I think of the after grief as motherless daughters for grownups, you know, <laughs> women who've lived with the loss for decades because it's now 39 years since my mother died. And I still think about her all the time and I can still tear up sometimes and same with my father. 
it's certainly not something that I got over or moved past. It's something I carried forward with me. And I didn't find enough books about that. I could find books that were sort of put a positive spin on loss, but usually it was more for the recent loss um, and helping you see that over time, it might become something that gives you meaning or purpose. And there were plenty of books about the pain of loss, but none of them really extended far into the future because that was, would be considered pathological to still be grieving to that extent 20 years later. But I really needed a book that said, how do those two marry together? How is it that we can have real meaning and purpose and growth in our lives, but still periodically have what are called grief spikes where we feel the loss all over again, but we feel it in new and different ways. What's that all about? And that's how the after grief was born. Oh my gosh, so many questions. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm remembering the kind of 10 year mark of my mother's death and, and how I, I got to that, that anniversary of her death and I felt an immense amount of shame that I had not gotten to a better place yet, that I, had, that I was not over my mother's death. Um, in your knowledge and experience, tell me why I felt that, you know, from what we now know, what you've discovered in this book, why did I feel that way? Well, I think part of it is because of the cultural messaging that we should get over a loss quickly, that we should get back to work, that there are stages of grief, that it's a time limited process, although nobody ever really puts a, a time stamp on it. Um, and, but there's a heavy, you know, there's a heavy sort of cultural imperative to pick ourselves up brush ourselves off, suck it up, and soldier on. Here's a lot of metaphors in there for you. But I've heard all of them, you know? Um, I remember even at my mother's funeral, people talking about how I had to get back to life and focus on my future. And I thought, wait a second, I get it that you don't want me to focus on the past, but like I'm in the present and I'm in pain right now. And that is a complete disavowal of the emotional pain that we feel when someone very important to us has just been taken from us, um, especially if it's, if it's a sudden death. So um, I would say part of that is because of the culture, cultural messaging. And part of that is because that's just how grief works. I interviewed 81 people for this book. And I really listened very, very carefully to their stories of grief over the long term. And by that, I mean anywhere between five and in some cases, 60 years yeah. post loss. And every single one of them, without exception, talked about a journey that they were on where that was like a expansion and contraction and they would expand out and they would feel lighter and they would feel that you know they had made sense of this loss and they got some meaning from it and then something would happen like an anniversary event or a reminder or a life transition and they would contract and, and really miss that person and then they would feel oh what's wrong with me if you know i should have gotten over it by now and I felt like we all, if there, I, I don't think that I could have, you know, statistic, it was just statistically improbable that I would pick 81 outliers to interview. Right. So I think, you know, they were telling me something. They were telling me that, you know, this is how it works. And the motherless daughters I interviewed for motherless daughters were saying the same thing. So it wasn't specific to women who lost their moms. It really was very much generalized to the, I think, the experience of long-term bereavement. And, but we didn't have a name for that. We didn't have a name for what comes after grief. I mean, I was still, I was writing this book, it took me four years to write this book, which we can talk about if you want. It was a monster of a project. But for like the first two or two and a half years, I was referring to what I was feeling 20 or 30 years later as grief. And it never felt right. I felt like grief is a really good term that honors that acute phase of intense emotional pain. But we don't have a name for what comes after that. And I was really racking my brain, like what comes after grief? Sorrow? No, because it's not just sadness. And then I thought, let's just call it the after grief because that is broad enough to encompass everything, all of the elements of it. And there are quite a few and they're not all sad ones or, or painful ones. I mean, I have, a whole list of what I call the missing elements of grief that include wonder and awe and appreciation and gratitude and resilience and humility and the things that we get to over the long term, but maybe don't feel right away. I think that is so interesting. Um, people ask me a lot if, I, if I'm still grieving for my, my parents who both died when I was young. And my answer is always, no, I'm not. I'm not actively grieving, but I have not known how to describe what it is I'm doing because I'm not over it, that their, their deaths, their existence, my relationships with them, 
are still a part of my daily life, but I don't know how to describe that because I'm not grieving anymore. So I'm so grateful that you wrote this book. May, may I quote you from the introduction to this book? Because you gave one of the, I thought the quotes that explained the experience as best as anyone could. That's why it's in the introduction. I'll just read you the paragraph. Yeah. It says, it's phenomenal how it never really goes away, says author and therapist Claire Bidwell-Smith. It changes shape and form all the time and comes back in different ways, even when you think it's gone. I'm 24 years out from the death of my mother and 17 years from the death of my father. And those losses have been with me in some fashion every day since they died. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's pathological. It's been pathologized in, you know, in, in the culture and in, in literature for much of the 20th century. I think that's actually how it works for us. I think that's, that's you know, pretty normative for those of us who have a big loss in the past. I agree. Why do you think it's taken us so long to get to this place where we can recognize that and we can really start to look at it? And I, and I don't think we have fully, I think you are at the forefront of this. You are pioneering this um, look and, and um, at, at the long arc of grief. So, but why, why is it taken so long? Well, I think on the one hand, it's because people don't want to hear or think or believe that at some level they will be grieving forever because that has connotations of oh, crying for the rest of their life or feeling sad for the rest of their life. And that's not what this is about at all. I just listed all those missing elements. I mean, those elements like appreciation and gratitude and humility and resilience have made my life very rich. And um, I don't play the game, would I rather give them up and have my mother back because I, I'm never gonna get that option. So I'm just grateful that they exist in my life. But I think, you know, the cultural messaging is deep and it lasted for a century, really 90 years from the 19 teens until, well, 80 years, I guess, from the 19 teens until well into the 1990s, we had this message that grief was something we needed to get over and we needed to get past and we needed to get back to work. And part of this was, you know, the, the if we go into the historical record, part of it was the influence of modernism and how we had to be productive and progressive. And that's how the stages of grief came about because they are linear and progressive and they lead us on a pathway out of emotional pain. And it was so seductive to believe that's how this might work. You know, I might start in a place of, of denial or anger, but I'll wind up in a place of acceptance if I just follow this path. But, you know, you know, and I know that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross never intended for her stages to be interpreted that way, but that's how, you know, the media and popular culture co-opted them. And right. that messaging goes deep. You know, I'm surprised by how many people I know that, that say, well, I'm in the anger stage or I'm in the denial stage um, for any kind of loss. You know, they really, it's that much a part of the lexicon. Well, why do you think, why do you think you felt that way? You know a lot about grief too. What do you think? I'm so curious about what you've discovered in this in this journey of research. Um, it was a lot of the messages, but I think a lot of those messages just come from fear. You know, people are so afraid to really sit with the pain, sit with the grief, sit with the sadness. They're afraid to sit with other people's discomfort. Yeah. We want to fix it as fast as we can. The moment you start to talk about your pain or discomfort, somebody wants to fix it. Well, can we do this? What if I come over and help you clean everything out? Or what if, what if I find you a date? Or whatever it is, you know, and those messages all they do is tell you to stop grieving and to be over it. Um, and I don't think they always come from a bad place. They come from a place of fear and vulnerability and discomfort. I'm really curious what you have learned because you've spent so much time studying women and specifically women who've lost mothers. What did you discover about masculine grief and messages that, that men get? Well, the messages that men get are even more um, about emotional, um, <clears throat> emotional closure you know, about not being expressive with your emotions. The, the, the messages about masculinity are that you can't appear vulnerable. You must appear strong. But um, it's known in the bereavement field that men and, the, I don't wanna say men and women grieve differently. What I wanna say is that there are masculine, what are called masculine and feminine styles of grief because some women adopt the masculine approach and some men adopt the feminine approach. But the feminine approach is what, um, what we think of usually when we think about grief which is crying and um, uh, longing and talking about how we feel and emoting 
And the masculine style is more about fixing and doing and problem solving. And it's not a coincidence that in other cultures, because I studied many other cultures and their grief practices, because grief is so culturally relative and so are, is mourning. In many other cultures, the women are encouraged to express their emotions and externalize them, while the men are given lots of tasks to do, like planning the funeral. And um, it, I believe it's about 80% of men will, you know, gravitate toward the problem solving and task oriented side, and 80% of women will gravitate more toward the emotional side, which is often why men and women don't understand and can't support each other when they're grieving the loss of the same person, because they're doing it differently. And I saw this a lot among the women I worked with for so many years when they were talking about their brothers or their fathers, you know, had a very different grieving style. It didn't mean they weren't sad or in pain. It just meant that they were working through that pain in a way that was unrecognizable to the women. And the men, because, you know, the message out there in the culture is that grief is supposed to look a certain way and it involves emotions, the men felt that maybe they were grieving wrong or weren't grieving at all. So the more we can educate ourselves about the, the variances and the different styles of grief, I think the more we can support each other in those different variations. Absolutely, I think it's um, fascinating. My my male clients always really fascinate me because they, my masculine clients, they have a they have a different approach um, to yeah. the way they're moving through it, and I I have to adopt a different approach as well, um, which is interesting. But I do think that it still comes back to this messaging that we get so much. Um, can you speak to, um, to two, two populations of, of extremes almost? Someone who's just lost someone maybe this year and yeah. someone who is 25 years out from a loss. Like, what are they going to find in your book right now that you, well, that you think is important for them to know? I think they will each find themselves in different places in chapters three, four, and five where I talk about three different kinds of grief. I sort of take grief responses and I put them in three broad categories and I call them new grief, old grief and new old grief. And <laughs> new, grief, new grief is a recent, you know, the, the pain that we feel in the acute phase when someone has just died. And it's very much attached to the absence of that person in our lives. And we are mourning the, either the suffering that they went through or the suddenness with which they were taken and, and the uh, lack of physical contact we have with them and our inability to connect with them in the, in the, the mortal physical plane. That is new grief. So if you have a very recent loss, that chapter talks a lot about what new grief is all about and how we tend to move back and forth between kind of a masculine and a feminine style that a balance is really important for us to adapt, meaning that we will dip into the emoting or the emotional pain and then go back into restorative activities like trying to problem solve, fix things, you know, deal with a will or take care of the children or whatever it is. Um, and old grief is what is are typically called anniversary reactions. And that's when um, grief becomes cyclical and you might have a response on the one year anniversary of the death or the 10 year anniversary of the death or the 23rd anniversary of the death or on a birthday, either yours or your loved one, or on a holiday. You know, it's typically um, related to a calendar, but it could be seasonal. If you've lost a child, you may find that the beginning of a school year is a time when, you know, grief may resurface or bubble. It's resurgent at those times. And old grief can also show up in conjunction with new grief when someone else dies. You may find there were pieces of a loss, especially if you were a child or teenager, that you couldn't access back then because maybe you didn't have the cognitive skills or you didn't have the emotional support and it will come up later attached or like piggybacked on, onto a, another loss later in your life. And then there's what I call new old grief. And this was always getting in the literature in the 20th century, sort of thrown in with anniversary events. Sometimes they were called age correspondence events, which is kind of a clunky term. So I call it new old grief. It's when you experience an old loss in a new way. And they're usually one time events. It's like you have a graduation or you're getting married or you become a parent or you go through a divorce and you're missing that parent in a way that you couldn't miss them or grieve them before. And an example I give is I really, really, really miss my mom when my first daughter was born. And there was no way that I could have grieved her absence as a grandmother when I was 17 
or you know, when I was 28 and writing motherless daughters, or even when I was pregnant, I don't think I could do it until I had that child in my arms, you know, healthy and crying and thinking, God, I so wish my mom were here to meet her, to help me, to know she was a grandmother, all of that. So that's new old grief. And then there's another type of new old grief, which is, and this is a big one in the parent loss community, but also in the sibling loss community, which is reaching the age your loved one was when they died and passing it. So in my case, that's, you know, in, in your case too, Claire, I know you're not there yet. It's, reach, it's reaching your mom's age at time of diagnosis if she had an illness and death and, and outliving her. That's so weird. It's so weird to be older than my mom. You know, like in my mind, she's still 42. And I mean, that's kind of how old you are, Claire, isn't it? That's just a little bit older than you. You're my colleague, you know, and my friend, but my younger colleague and my mom is you know, how is that even possible? I don't know. But another big one is when your child reaches the age you were when, when a parent died um, or when your sibling died also. And that, that was a big deal for me when both of my daughters turned 17. And so you'll, you know, you have a ways to get there with your girls. But you'll see I mean, those, you've touched on a lot of big points for me. There was that 10 year mark when I was 28, where I felt a lot of shame and confusion about why I was still you know, caught up in this loss. Um, the birth of my first daughter, I have, I have three children now, um, six technically, but uh, that's a long story. Um, but the birth of my first daughter was, it was just cataclysmic. I mean, it was, it just ripped me open. And my poor husband at the time had no idea what to do with that. Um, and I couldn't explain it. You know, it was, it was missing my mother, but also realizing why I missed her. Having that mother-daughter connection, that mother-child connection made me realize why I missed her. Um, and then my divorce from that husband completely leveled me again. And that really, that opened me up in a, I think the one time event that you're kind of referring to that caused me to grieve my whole family all over again and my right. sense of family all over again. Um, but yes, now I'm 42 and I, I'm watching my 11 year old and in three years, she will be the age that I was when my parents both got cancer. And I'm very, I'm, I'm already aware of it. I'm watching her and I'm thinking about it. And when she's that age, when she's 18, it's, it's going to be a lot. You've been through those years with your daughters already. I have because my youngest is 18 and I had this completely irrational response when she turned 17. And I, I think she was like 17 and a month, which was about how old I was when my mom died. And I just sort of thought, well, that's it, I'm done. She doesn't need me anymore, which was ridiculous because of course she needs me. You know, she texts or FaceTimes me with questions and needed for support, you know, every day or two. But um, I had this feeling like, okay, but I also had this feeling of like real sadness and relief at the same time. The sadness was that my mom never got to raise her kids beyond that point. And I was gonna get that. And I was gonna know what that was like. And she never did. That was real sad for me. But there was a sense of relief like, oh, I got them there. Like, they're going to be okay now. Like, if anything happens to me, they'll be okay because I was 17 and I, and I turned out okay. It wasn't easy, but I got there, you know? And, and that also is not necessarily true because they would, I'm sure, you know, be devastated to lose a mom just as I was. But these are the kinds of tapes that were playing in my head. And, and I learned from meeting so many motherless daughters and leading so many retreats. You know, we have hundreds of women who've come through the retreats that that's not at all uncommon. In fact, it's a very common tape that plays in our minds. Yeah. I wanna open it up to questions and comments soon or anything you wanna come on and, and talk to Hope about or me about or both of us. Um, but first I wanna ask you one more question. Tell us about, about these positives. You know, For someone who is um, either new in new grief or someone who is feeling stuck, you use that term in a really interesting way in your book, you talk about feeling stuck. Someone who's feeling stuck in their losses later into them, what do we have to look forward to or how can we embrace it and find it? If well, I mean, it? First, if you're feeling stuck, I identify 12 areas in which people tend to feel stuck. And there is a, an online course, in fact, just about this at motherlessdaughters.com because it's so common. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons we might feel stuck. It might be because we have not, we're not encouraged or didn't learn how to have an inner, inner relationship with our mom. So we feel like a piece of us is still stuck in the past. Or it might be that it was a traumatic loss and the trauma never got stabilized. So we never really got to be able to grieve. And um, there's lots of different reasons why we might feel stuck. Um, <clears throat> but what was the question again? Because I just got way into feeling stuck there. Just tell us about the positives and like oh, either, yeah. if, if, we're, if we're in new grief, give us some hope that 
that we're good, that there's going to be another side. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The epilogue is all about that. I promise you, I promise you, it will not feel like this forever. You may not get to the feeling of appreciation or gratitude or wisdom or insight um, right away. It takes a while. That's part of the long arc of grief. When you're able to look back and say, oh, wow, that loss set in motion a chain of events. And those events, you know, in cause and effect fashion, led to this really good thing in my life today. And that's where appreciation starts to come from. But we don't always see that for a while. You know, it takes, it takes time for that to unfold. Um, or it may be that you will see how your worldview changes and that things that maybe were important to you before may not be as important and things that weren't as value, didn't feel as valuable now are really important. We were all experiencing this during COVID. Things that you know we had to let go of that we realized maybe weren't really that important. And then things that we're discovering are much more important like, like nuclear families in some cases. Um, so that's all that, but that's all part of the long arc. And I tell people just have faith. Faith is one of the things that we develop hope, you know, that you just radically exercise some of your faith and hope that it will be different because it will. I, I listen up by now I have interviewed and met thousands and thousands and thousands of women who've lost their mothers and hundreds of people who have lost others, men and women who've lost other family members. And there isn't one who said 20 years later, I'm still feeling as bad as I did in that first year. There are some who say, I'm still really, really struggling more than I think I should. And, and oftentimes there's, you know, professional help can be really helpful. And Claire, maybe you could say a few words about if you're feeling that 10 or 20 years later, what you might do or how you might avail yourself of resources. Um, I hear people say sometimes it feels as fresh, but I, I've never met anyone who says I've been actively, acutely grieving for 20 years. Claire, what, what do you have to say about that? Because I think it's important for us to acknowledge that sometimes you know, we do really still feel bad after 10 or 20 years. I think there's so much we can do at that point. I, I don't think um, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to find yourself in that place. And maybe, maybe it's you've been carrying that on or maybe it's been um, reignited in some way like we've talked mm -hmm. about. There's so much work. Often people will come to me in their first six months of grieving and there's really not a lot we can do. I can hold space for you. I can normalize your feelings. I can educate you about the grief process, but some of the really amazing grief work you can do does come much later. Um, you can really look at how this has shaped you, really work through some of the pain and loss or feelings right. that come with it. There's so much, and I hope you do this same work. It's incredible. Um, so I, but I think what stops people is they think, oh, it's been 20 years. There's something else wrong with me, or I should be over this, and they don't seek the help. Whereas I think that you should. There are so many of us out here in the grief world who really embrace working with that older loss, um, and I and I think people don't quite realize that. Yes, and it's really important to find a therapist or a professional or a coach who has experience working with that over the long term because it is a really different skill set, I think, to bring to sessions where you can, um, where you know what can really help a client um, get unstuck or work with reactivated grief. You know, I talk a lot in the after grief about stories and the stories that we tell ourselves, because really our story of loss is a story that we construct to make sense of what happened. But that story is ever changing, or it can be if we let it be. And our identity can change in addition as our story changes. And a lot of the work that I do in coaching and in my online courses is to help people revisit, reassess, and in some cases revise their stories of loss so that because you can create a story of loss that is more strengthening and more empowering than maybe the one that you've been telling yourself for a while. That doesn't mean that you have to let go of a story that has really sad or traumatic or hard facts in it because the facts are the facts. I don't ask anyone ever to give up a story that they've been carrying, but I try to help my clients create an alternative narrative that's equally true, that they can carry side by side. And so we're just reframing the same facts because both two things can be true. And we look at how we, how, we, how we might feel or how our lives might be different if we can carry both of those stories forward instead of just one. Yeah, absolutely. I wanna to get to some of these questions. Um, Garrick asks, Hope, how long does acute grief typically last? You know, that really depends on so many factors. It depends on, well, uh, how old you were at the time of loss because for children it's different than adults. 
Um, and, and that's not what you would think. That doesn't mean that children are in acute grief for much longer. Typically children are in the acute phase much shorter because they can't handle the emotional pain without support. So they'll often suppress it. Um, how old you were, um, the cause of loss, um, sudden and traumatic losses, especially if they were violent, can take longer you know, to process and make sense of. Um, who, it, who it was who died, how close you were to them, your temperament, the family's communication style. So there's a lot of factors. I mean, I think ballpark, we typically say, could be anywhere between three to six months, all the way up to two years, pretty much. I mean, generally, if it's more than a year or two and you're still feeling exactly the way you did right after the loss, you might be experiencing what's known as complicated grief, which about 15% of the bere of the bereaved um, tend to experience. It's now believed that most of those people had pre-existing anxiety or depression when they were studied. Um, but there's about 15% of people who may, after a year or two, still really feel like they can't get back to optimal functioning or even baseline functioning. And that's when professional help is really, um, it can be professional assistance can be really helpful because there are people trained to work in, in instances of complicated grief. But I'm gonna say, you know, I can't look at someone and say, oh, it's a year, you know, you should be over it because the circumstances might be, and it's also possible, sometimes people cannot grieve at the time of loss. I mean, cannot grieve the way that they wish they could in order to process their feelings. I'm of the firm belief, because I hear people say all the time, I never grieved my mother. I didn't get to grieve my father. I never grieved my brother. And I say, I'm gonna encourage you to think about that or to consider that a little bit differently. Let's consider that maybe you grieved to the best of your ability at the time of loss. And maybe your ability at that time was very, very limited because you didn't have support, because you had to focus on survival instead, because you had dependent children you had to take care for if you were suddenly widowed. It may not, you may not actually be in a place of emotional or financial or physical stability to grieve, which are conditions that we often need for a year or two. So you're just starting then, that can happen. So that's why I'm really reluctant to put a, a, a solid time frame on it. Claire, would you agree? I totally agree. However, I do think that acute grief lasts longer than people think it will um, or can. I think that, I think that if you're new to grief or you're not part of this kind of grief world that you and I are in, I think people would, would, would answer, oh, it's two weeks. It's, you know, four oh, yeah. weeks. And really, no, it can be up to two years of acute grieving, you know, and I think that most people underestimate that. And I, I'm always trying to normalize that and give people a little more permission to extend their really intense grief periods. Um, yeah. Um, another question from Linda is, uh, can we be grieving our normal life before COVID? I'm sorry, what was the question? Can we? Can we be grieving our normal life before COVID? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we are grieving the sense of normalcy or things that we enjoyed or depended on that we can't have anymore. Um, there are people who are grieving the loss of a job, the loss of financial security, the loss of certain, the freedom of just being able to go out and about without being afraid that it might threaten your health. I think absolutely. I think there's a lot of grief and, and also some of what's coming up you know, in this COVID year for those of us who have had a significant death in the past is that some of the feelings of helplessness or fear or despair in the body feel so familiar that they're reactivating grief responses you know, around a loss in the past. Are you seeing that too, Claire? I am, absolutely. There's a lot of, of reigniting that's coming up and uh -huh. a lot of things that I don't think people realize they're feeling, that they are feeling. And again, I just think this, this permission to grieve, like, please give yourselves permission to grieve everything you're feeling. There's no reason not to. There's no reason to not honor that grief that you're feeling. Um, I think I've, what I've seen this year, which is really, I'm still struggling to grapple with it, is kind of grief shaming, where other people are judging how other people are grieving, oh. or if they're grieving. And it's driving me crazy. Um, there's been a lot of shaming going on all year anyway, but just this idea that like, oh, that person doesn't deserve to be grieving or that person, whatnot. And so my message always is permission to grieve. Please give yourself permission to grieve. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. And I also want to point out, there's no competition in suffering. That's what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said. And I don't believe that we have to say, well, I'm really grieving, but there are other people who have it worse. 
you know, and sometimes it does make us feel better to put things in perspective. But if we're using that as a way to suppress our own feelings of loss or sadness, um, I want to give you permission to not do that because suffering is suffering. You know, we all have our own contexts and um, it's bad. If it's bad for you, it, feel ba it feels bad for you. It's bad for you. Even if maybe objectively someone else is struggling more. I totally agree. Megan has an interesting question for you. She's a grief and loss therapist. Um, she loved your book, read it straight through till 3 a.m. Um, she's curious if you have any thoughts on people who have strong spiritual religious backgrounds versus someone who does not and how that impacts the grief process. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to be doing an online program next month and we're spending a whole module talking about what I call the five aspects of grief, which are emotional and mental, which are the ones that we think of first physical, which doesn't always get as much um, attention, but you know, we do hold grief in our bodies and social, which we've kind of lost in the past hundred years, although grief groups have been bringing back and reimagine is bringing back the social element in grief. Thank you so much, Dara, for that work. It's critically important, but the spiritual is I think really essential. And we often confuse, confuse spiritual with religious. So let's talk about that first. Yes, I have encountered a number of people who have a very strong religious framework for the afterlife or for death and dying. That gives them a lot of comfort. They believe they will see their loved ones again. They believe that their loved ones have gone to a better place and that gives them solace. Um, those who don't have those beliefs may be grappling with more existential concerns. And I think that the existential nature of grief is really important and it does to me fall under the spiritual because it is um, a blow to our spirits, you know, especially if you're young, when someone you love is here all the time and then they're not, that's like a spiritual injury that we experience and we don't know where they went and we're trying to make sense of it. So I think there may be more in the, in what's called the story development stage or the sense making stage. There may be more struggle when you're grappling mainly with loss as an existential experience. If you don't have um, a religious dogma that tells you how to think that you, that you really firmly believe in. Um, but I do think of, of losing someone that you love, especially when you're young, as an existential crisis. And I feel like we really need to talk more about that and create ways to help each other and support each other, which is not necessarily to try to impose beliefs on somebody. You know, like the people who told me that my mother was in a better place did not, that was not helpful. That was not a helpful message to me as a teenager because I thought, no, the best place for my mom, and I know she would agree, is here with her children. So I can't, I, I can't accept that she's in a better place. I hope she is in a peaceful place. I hope you know, she is in a place where she still gets to be herself, but I don't think she would think that she's in a better place now. And, and I really struggled with that for a long time. It actually you know, created not just an existential and spiritual crisis, but a religious crisis in me as well. I hope that answers Megan's question. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a really important component of it that has been overlooked um, or underlooked the spiritual component of grieving, the spiritual religious. I almost feel like it's a it's a phase unto itself of grieving, you know, just getting to this place where we start to really think about what do we believe about meaning of life, um, afterlife, our connections to those that we've lost and loved. And that's a part of the grieving process itself is getting to that place. And it's something I, ex I know I explore with all of my clients. Um, yes. And so, um, we have a couple questions here that I'm gonna combine for you, Hope, because I think they kind of go together. Okay. Eric is asking, when does a mourner enter after grief? Ah. And this kind of goes with Cato's question, which is interesting. He says, or she says, what about grief that was suppressed and not dealt with when you were a child? I was 13 and lost a younger brother who was nine. I feel like my mother's death three years ago suddenly reopened that loss from 20-ish years ago. And now I feel like I'm actually grieving my brother. Is this old grief, new old grief? I don't know how to explain it or talk about it. So, yeah. Well, you know, let's start first with what might get in the way of a 13-year-old grieving. And that might be that the family was not capable of openly expressing their emotions or supporting the child in her grief. And there may not have been an adult outside of the family that gave her the space in order to process her feelings. Also, you know, a 13-year-old is not completely cognitively or emotionally mature. Children grieve in bits and pieces over the course of their childhood and adolescence as they develop intellectual skills and abstract thinking 
and the death means different things to them at different times in their own development. So 13 is pretty young. So I would, um, in my clients, I would, I would anticipate that a 13 year old would have to process pieces of it later on. And yes, it comes up when other losses occur. That's exactly what I was talking about with old grief. I call that proxy grief, actually, that someone dies and we're in new grief, like for your mom, but there's a proxy grief, which is what you didn't get to grieve in the past for your brother. But you know, even though it may feel overwhelming right now, because there's two people at once that you might feel that you're grieving, it's a good thing because I think of it like as a, a cleansing experience. You know, you've been hold, maybe holding on to some of that, those old feelings that you didn't get a chance to um, feel or process. And now you're gonna, they're gonna be able to move through you. They won't get backed up in your body because we actually know that grief that is forcibly suppressed will show up in different ways in our systems. It often shows up physically. It can show up in cardiovascular problems and autoimmune diseases. It's been linked to certain kinds of cancer. Um, so we want to be able to express it. And, you know, our, our American, I should, or I should say our, our Western, which is predominantly, not exclusively, of course, but predominantly white Protestant way of dealing with grief and mourning in the dominant culture here, doesn't do a great job with giving us opportunities after the funeral or memorial service to release that th th grief, especially if it's resurgent or reactivated. Later, there are other cultures have a much better have much better methods for doing that. You'll read in the book about the Dagara tribe in Burkina Faso, Afri Africa, which I think has one of the most fascinating grief rituals and, and way to handle mourning that I've come across. And I mean, they believe that it is important for mental and physical hygiene to be able to release your grief. And so on their tribal lands in Burkina Faso, Almost any day, there will be a grief ritual going on where members of the community are invited to come and release their grief, however they need to, by moving their bodies, by wailing, by crying, by shrieking or shouting, by pounding on objects. Um, and they need to do it in nature. It's believed that you release it you know, into the land. Um, but um, you can come if your best friend stopped talking to you or you lost a job or your grandmother died or you become a widow. I mean, any form of loss, they think it's really important to let it move through the body and to do it out in the natural world. And I think, oh, wow. You know, if we did that in this culture, I think we would have less depression. We would have less anger. We would have less violence. Um, I think we would have, you know, better physical outcomes. I wish that was something that we could adopt in this culture too and, and others. Thank you. I'm just scrolling to comments. And there's so many that we're not going to have time to get to, but that are amazing. And I think it, because this topic is so huge and it's so layered and there's so many things to kind of peel back and look at. Um, this is an interesting one from Elizabeth. She says, my father died after a short illness when he was 65. Last year, I turned to 65 and embraced the year with gusto. But then when I turned 66, I started to feel guilty for having another year, one that my father did not get to enjoy, and I threw myself into my work. Is that normal? What can I do to move past the feeling of living on borrowed time? Yes, this is what um, I, I, I tell people often is how weird it was to turn 42 and be the same age as my mother, but that 43 was even weirder. And now I'm 14 years past. Um, I find that with each passing year, I have a, a deeper and more enduring state of gratitude for every year or every month or even every day that I get. And I try to, for me, to honor, you know, my mother in her, what now feels like her very brief life, even though she had 42 years, is to, in some ways, embody her values so that they can still exist in the world and also in some ways not exclusively because then it's not my choice but live the life that she didn't get to live you know and so i will visit a place maybe that i know she always wanted to visit and and do it for both of us and i feel like i'm carrying her forward that way but i want to just circle back for a minute because there was a question about how do you know when you're in the after grief and um, i just want to make sure i get to answer that um, i think it's different for every person Sometimes it is a very, you know, a very discreet moment when you wake up in the morning and you're not feeling that weight on your shoulders that's been there for about a year. Sometimes it's the first time you laugh after months of not feeling any joy. And sometimes it's a much more gradual process. Um, but I, I think of the after grief starting when the most acute emotional pain starts to recede. And you can often feel that in your body. Um, 
And then it starts there and it sort of phases in as that acute grief phases out. So it's kind of like a gray area for a while. And then it extends for the rest of your life. I really do believe that to be true. After 39 years, I feel like I've lived long enough to be able to say that. Um, I want to touch on a question from Lisa that, that has some, uh, some bigger things. Like she wants to know um, how does she get in touch with grief if she's had a hard time, struggled with it throughout her life to not, she doesn't feel it she's not feeling in touch with her grief. But I think there could be a lot of people listening right now too who are realizing that maybe they didn't finish grieving or they suppressed their grief because they didn't realize they were allowed to continue grieving. What are ways we can get in touch with grief if we're not feeling connected to it right now or we're feeling like we could do some more grieving? Well, there's two answers to that question. It might be that Lisa doesn't experience grief the way that she thinks grief is supposed to feel. I mean, I remember a woman at a retreat saying to me, I feel like everyone else here is crying and, and I just, I can't cry. I'm not crying. I feel like, you know, something's wrong with me. Like, how do I access the tears? And I said, maybe your style, your temperament, you know, your somatic makeup, your physiology, it's just different. It's possible because she really missed her mom. She really wished her mom was still there. She just didn't emote it the same way that um, sort of the, the, the majority of people that she observed were feeling it. So that is possible. It is also possible that that grief may have been suppressed. Um, so um, if this, I'm sorry, what was her name? Who said this? Lisa. Lisa. If, um, if Lisa were my client, I would first look at, okay, was there any trauma around the loss? You know, do you need some trauma informed therapy or to stabilize the trauma? Because that often gets in the way of grief because sometimes when we're, when we feel like we might be able to tap into some feelings of sorrow or sadness or anger around how someone dies. Um, sometimes if we haven't stabilized the trauma, we bump up against the trauma. We have oftentimes a physical trauma response that happened to me for years. I mean, my mom, even though she died of cancer in the end, it was very sudden and she had a precipitous decline and I was at home and I was taking care of her a bit and I really saw her suffering and that was very traumatic for me as a teenager. And so every time for the next couple of years that someone asked any kind of question about my mother, no matter how innocent, like even, you know, like, what was your mother's name? I would have a physical trauma response. Like my heart would start beating really quickly and I'd get short of breath and my limbs would get cold and, and numb. And I didn't realize for years that's what was happening. But until I really went into and revisited and worked on the trauma around that loss, I don't think I could get to the grief. It took me seven years to get there. And I, I think that's why. So that's another reason why. Um, Claire, what would you say to Lisa? Because I'm sure you have lots of clients that are, you know, in. Um, I, do think, I do think that it's easy to avoid grief. I think it's, so, that's the wrong it is for some people. I think for some people, they can really get avoidant with their grief. And I do think that there are opportunities to grieve. And I've met and worked with a lot of clients who haven't allowed themselves to grieve for multiple reasons, personality, cultural messages, family dynamics, um, what have you. And so I think there are a lot of opportunities, however far you are into your loss, to find ways and create ways to grieve. Um, and I think it's an important thing to do. And I think do that with the right therapist who can really take you into that journey and help you unlock a lot of things. I think you can do it by just creating little rituals for yourselves, looking through old photo albums, listening to certain music, like setting a certain time when you're going to open up your grief. I've had clients who are very organized and busy and they just can't fathom opening up that door. It's so scary. They can't fathom opening up that door to their grief and loss. It just... They feel like I won't be able to take care of my kids or my job or what have you. I can't open that door. And so creating almost like scheduling little grief moments, you know, like on Saturday afternoon at two o'clock when I know I don't have to do anything else that night, I'm going to sit down and look through some old pictures of my mom, or I'm going to write a letter, or I'm going to do this thing. And I think it's really beautiful and important and can help you. And this can be six months out, 20 years out, whatever it is. Well, we see it at the retreats. I think that's what we're doing when we are leading retreats, Claire, is that we're giving women from a Thursday evening at five o'clock until Sunday at about noon. And we're giving them like parentheses around that time to have whatever experience or revisit the loss in whatever way they're ready for at that time. Sometimes we're just not ready to grieve. But what I hear um, frequently is the statement, I'm afraid if I start crying, I will never stop. 
And I want to unpack that for you a little bit, because first of all, it is physiologically impossible to start crying and never stop. It's not, you will not die of dehydration. You know, it's just the average amount of time that someone cries is, you know, for women, I think it's about, for men, I think it's six minutes and it's in the book. Um, for women, it's a little longer. Um, you will not start crying and never stop. I think what that is, is a fear that I won't be able to regulate my own emotions. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't learn how to as a child, or maybe you had parents who were particularly strict about or had a lot of emotional control over you. Uh, there's all different reasons why we might be afraid we can't regulate our emotions. But if you can find someone to companion you in your grief, which is a, just a compassionate listener, like women get at the retreats, you know, we see, you know, women will really cry hard for like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and then it moves through them and it passes because, you know, we, we don't tend to stay with an emotion for much longer than 10 or 12 minutes in a really intense way. I, I don't think we're wired to do that. But I think, you know, we are afraid that we will be alone with our sadness and that we won't be able to rein it back in. And I think that's when it's really important. That's why the social aspect of grief is so important because having people around you who can hold that space for you, like a therapist does, like a support group does, like our retreat groups do, and say, it's okay, you know, we're gonna sit here with you as long as you need to express that. And um, typically it's like, you know, 10, 12 minutes and then people start really feeling better and they're like, wow, I'm so relieved. I finally got that out. Cause what you're doing is you're externalizing the emotion. You're not keeping it, you know, um, bottled up because it's when it's bottled up that's when it starts affecting us it, it, physically it affects our blood pressure we know that to be true that level of stress creates inflammation in the body all of these adverse effects can occur absolutely so i think um i love this companioning through grief i think it, i think it's another thing that people are afraid to do they don't they don't think they should need help or want help through this but God, we all need help through this you know so don't be afraid to find a companion in grief in a book, in a therapist, in asking for help in a support group. There's incredible things online right now happening because of COVID, which is a positive thing. Um, one question here that I think touches back to you, that kind of feeling of, of getting stuck that I think is really an, such an incredible important thing about this book because I think it is something so many people struggle with in their long-term loss. Um, Marjorie says, people always say that it will get better or you will find meaning. I guess I'm stubborn, but I always think I don't want to get better. I don't want to find meaning. How could it be better if she's still gone? I get stuck at this. She just shouldn't have died. I never hear anyone who shares this feeling. Have you encountered clients who feel the same? Hmm. Well, um, I think it may be that what may help this, Marjorie, is that her name? Marjorie may be creating a story that says, you know, as long as I'm feeling the pain or feeling bad or feeling, you know, that this was an injustice or it doesn't make sense, I'm still feeling close to that person. So two things that I would work with, you know, in, in a client. One is to say, okay, well, what are some other additional? We're not going to ask you to let go of that because it may have been an injustice. It may have been something that you never wanted to happen. Maybe you'll never be able to make sense of it. It's really hard to make sense of certain deaths, suicides, homicides in particular, really hard. Um, COVID deaths right now, people are having a very hard time making sense of COVID deaths. Uh, or deaths from COVID. So in a, what, what alternative narrative can we, you know, bring, the, okay, so what good things might this lead to? What kind of meaning over time might we be able to divine from this? Or, you know, start just very gently start working in that direction without letting go of that story, because it may in fact be that um, feeling that that's helping you feel close, but in what other ways can you also feel close to your loved one? What other things can you do in addition to balance that out? And let's just see how that feels. Doesn't feel good, we stop doing it. If it feels good, we'll do more of it. You know, if, if um, incorporating some of your mom's hobbies or some of her values into your daily life or putting pictures of her up or, you know, finding other ways to create an internal relationship with her that isn't just about connecting through the death, but is also connecting through her life. Because let's remember, I always say this my mom was not just a woman who died she was a woman who lived for 42 years and sometimes I forget that especially in the work that I do because I'm talking all the time about her death and her absence but she also lived for 42 years and for 17 of those years she was my mom and I want to celebrate those years in addition to focusing on the time around you know her illness and her death 
Oh my gosh, Hope, I could talk to you all night. Um, and I, I'm just, I am profoundly grateful to you for all of your work. Um, your first book, your most recent book, all the books in between, your partnership, and just everything you have done for people who are trying to find their way through grief and loss. Um, how can we find you? Where can, how can we work with you? What do you have? Where can you find your book? Tell us all. There's so much coming up. Um, it's busy. Um, at hopeedelman.com, you can find out about my coaching. At theaftergrief.com, you can find out. I have a free live event coming up this Sunday. Everybody's welcome. Uh, it's going to be a little more instructive than this conversation, but it's going to go deeper. And then I'm going to be having a four-week program in November that has information that's not in the book because I have lots and lots of files like this of information that I couldn't fit in the book. So I'm going to put it in the course instead. It sort of picks up where the book leaves off and expands on that material. So that's at theaftergrief.com. And then hopeedelman.com for coaching on my other books. And motherlessdaughters.com for specific uh, offerings for motherless daughters. Thank you so much, Hope. Um, thank you guys all for being here. We have more guests lined up throughout the series and season. And we're going to keep talking about all of these things because I think that we all need permission to grieve. We need permission to struggle during this time. It's okay if you're not feeling okay. Um, there are people like Hope out here who are doing this incredible work to support you and educate you. And I want, I'd like to say that I just tried to contact you on your webpage, Hope, mm -hmm. and the, the contact page wouldn't scroll down to the submit button. Oh, that's weird. Okay, which, which, I'll, I'll check on that for you. Which one? HopeEdelman.com? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We just and launched that. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask my tech person. Thank you for letting me else, know. But how Hope, else can I reach you? Hope at hopeedelman.com. Fine. Just send me, just send me an email. Hope at hopeedelman.com. Okay. And I want to thank great. Dara for the incredible work that she and the whole Reimagined team do here to help us have more cultural awareness and conversations about death, dying, bereavement. And Claire, you know how much I love you. You are a shining light in this field. I'm so grateful for the work that we've done together and the work that you do. Flash making me literally at this point. It's gotten dark in here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Thank you. I, I realized I looked orange. That was that was happening on the screen. But um, thank you so much, Hope, and of course, thank you, Claire. I I felt like I don't know. It was almost like we were at a slumber party, actually, as it was getting darker over there with you, Claire. <laughs> and I just felt like we were all like listening in. It was um, it was beautiful. And I'll just say that. Um, in addition to holding space, continuing, um, uh, Hope and I are talking about other programming, so keep your um, eyes out on uh, the Reimagine website. And all of those links that she's pasted, um, we will include them in the follow-up email as well as a recording um, of this conversation if you want to revisit that. Um, That's terrific, thanks. And um, I guess just the other thing I just wanted to let everyone know about, um, uh, that um, we have been doing this initiative called Mourning into Unity, um, which is with uh, houses of worship across the country um, to collectively mourn our losses. And um, we are having vigils um, online um, that you can join, um, you know, even including like St. John the Divine, which is the big cathedral in New York, um, on uh, Monday evening. So I just pasted the schedule um, if you're interested in signing up. Thank you. Thank you, Reimagine. Thank you, Dara. Thank you, Hope. Thank you, everybody who is here tonight. Great. Okay. Yeah. And if you want, everybody can come off mute if you'd like to just say a collective goodbye. Oh, this really is what we do in the motherless daughters community at the end of a call. So we're going to share that with all of you, everybody. Thank Love you, Hope and Claire. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Be healthy and thank safe, you everybody. So very much. Be My well. hands don't do the heart very well, but thank here's you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Hope and Claire. Thank you for the group. Thank you, Dara.